Hey everyone, this is the Epic Book Review. Did you know that? No. <laughs> Do you not love that music? I love that, yes. <laughs> I'm really excited now. Yeah, I was very excited. Hey, so Allison Apsey, uh, uh, I have asked her to be on this podcast forever <laughs> to talk about her new, or actually, her uh, newish, let's say newish book called Leading the Whole Teacher. Now, I read this book and this is a signed copy, so you can have it. This is just for me. And I absolutely loved it. I thought it was so well done. I've known Allison forever. And I'm so excited that you didn't have to do something way more important today that you're going to avoid me again. Right. So thanks for being on the podcast. It is my, I, I postponed my target run today. <laughs> Right. So that we can spend some time together. Yeah. Listen, Thank you and, for having me. And okay, so this is so it is 1 30 p.m. that when we're recording this. We met at noon and we're gonna have some exciting news for you oh, yes. in the future, but we're just gonna hold off on that and just a little little what is that? Is it a teaser? Is that a teaser? Is that what that's yes. called? Yes, foreshadowing. Foresha yes. foreshadowing. There you go. All right. Okay, so Here's the thing. I said this book, Leading the Whole Teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so this book, I love it. Absolutely love it. And I said it's new-ish. And the reason I said it's new-ish is because this is how long Allison has been avoiding me. <laughs> she actually has another book out with Jessica Gomez called Lead with Collaboration. And, it's, and both these books are doing amazingly well. They're really resonating with audiences. I really love the way that you... The way you tell stories, and we were talking about this before, the way you tell stories and actually mix some evidence and data in there. And this is the thing that I've always struggled with books is that they're way too story driven or they're way too heavy academically. And the reason why I say is like story, there's no meat to it. There's no like, well, where are you getting these ideas from? And then the 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 two academic -y, I can't get through them. They're like just hard to read and I don't really see the connection. And you just do such a nice combination of this i'm sure lead with collaboration which is sitting at like basically uh a, almost a five like a 4.9 it's probably like a 4.999 because they don't run up to five yeah. um on there as well so before we get into leading the whole teacher can you tell us just a little bit about lead with collaboration which you co-wrote with jessica gomez yeah so the the partnership with jessica started back in 2019 when we met at nasp in spokane washington and then we put in a proposal to present together on a session called flipping the script to create a culture of collaboration during staff meetings. And of course, then in 2020, the, the pandemic canceled the conference. So we presented together in 2021 hmm. and we, it was, it was received really well. And we just noticed the need from leaders to collaborate around making staff meetings transformational and collaborative and build the culture of the school. So um, it's been a couple years in the works, but it is Lead with Collaboration, a complete guide for transforming staff meetings. And it's really a look at how do we plan for the staff meeting? How do we communicate? How do we set up to what's like the meat of the staff meeting? And then the thing that a lot of leaders forget about, and I was just as guilty, that concluding with clarity and inspiration in the follow-up after the staff meeting to make sure that it has a lasting impact. So we have we have a framework. We have lots of over 100 ideas and strategies included in the book. And um, it's been it's been yeah, it's been a, quite a journey. It just came out a, a few weeks ago and it's doing really well. So, you know, actually, it, it's funny because when you talk about this, a lot of people are like, really, like this is about staff meetings. There is a uh, there is a slide I've shared forever. And it says this, if I die, I hope it's during a staff meeting because a transition to death would be so subtle. <laughs> I remember you showing that. Yes. Right. And so when you, it's actually hilarious because that's how people feel about this time. And, you know, if it's not valuable, don't do it. Um, I, before we get into leading the whole teacher, I do want to ask you this. Okay. So there is, I'm just curious your thoughts on this, right? Cause it's like, well, like, why did you just send it an email? That's like the, there's that conversation, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. in a staff meeting. But then I've heard administrators say, because you don't read the emails. 
right? Have yeah. you ever heard that before? Like, because oh there's gosh. both sides, right? It's like just send an, send an email, but also like I will if you read it, right? It's it's interesting because um, when we talk about workload, there in leading the whole teacher, there is a couple of sections really dedicated to email because that is a oh, wow. beast that we don't utilize appropriately as leaders often. And I love when you get the emails that say the title of the email and then in capitals, please read. Because what does that imply about all the other emails that you send? Right. Like, right. I think we could cut down on emails drastically and we might get increased readership. Um, but as far as staff meeting being in the email, I totally get that because if the staff meeting does not require the collaborative expertise of everybody in the room, then right. it shouldn't be a meeting. Totally. I agree. I agree. And you know, that, the, the thing with the email, uh, I can't, I think I wrote this in innovators mindset. It was basically the war. It's like someone, I can't remember who referenced it, but they called it the, the war and peace emails, you know, like the book, the war and peace. And it's like gigantic. And when you like, sometimes I would get emails and you would just see them physically and you'd get sick. Cause you're like, Oh my God, like there's yeah. so much to get through. And I, I'm a very to the point guy. And when I send emails of stuff I need from people, I put it in point form. And then when they write a story back, I'm like, no, <laughs> like I'm trying to model something here. Please like, just, just, you know, just bold your answers. That's all I need. I don't need the, I don't need to kind of decipher these answers. Right. Did you talk about that? I'm curious. Um, yes, actually. And I, I wrote a blog post that, that was, um, pretty well received uh, talking about email itself. And one of the quotes, I think I, I was trying to look it up. It's brevity is the soul of wit. And mm -hmm. that's William Shakespeare and how we think we sound really smart if we write a lot, but actually if we can say a lot in a little bit of writing, we sound even smarter. Um, so like the no scroll rule, if I'm going to send out an email, I want it to be an email that you can pull up on your screen and read it without having to scroll down. Cause the other thing I love is like those super long emails that you get like on Saturday night and the person says, I hope you're not reading this on Saturday night and not working over the weekend. I'm right. thinking, why are you sending it to me on Saturday night? Right. I for sure am never going to read that email now. Schedule send, my favorite thing on yes, Google yes. Mail and snooze. Schedule send and, and uh, snooze. Okay. I love it. So everyone check out the book, Lead with Collaboration. Allison wrote that with Jessica Gomez. Blowing up on Amazon right now. So congratulations to Thank both you. of you. All right. Uh, I, so this is, this is something when I moved to Orlando, I think, yeah, I think I started as I, I'm going to be a little honest. I don't like reading. I've really struggled with reading my entire life. And I committed to just reading paper books. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I hate saying this. I don't really read many education books. And I, I like to kind of, cause I, I feel like I'm just inundated with education stuff all the time. That I want to see outsider perspectives and trying to connect this, but yours is one I read and I read the whole thing. I loved it. I thought it was very powerful. Um, you know, and I, there's like, I highlighted some stuff. Wow. Holy I, cow. Put, I did. I really liked it. So, so I got three questions for you. First of all, I think this is kind of like a no brainer question but it's really important. Leading the whole teacher, why did you even write the book in the first place? Right, yeah. So I think it's- Never a no brainer, brainer, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> right, like especially like this kind of post-pandemic world that we're living in. But yeah. I did start this book before COVID-19 was part of right. our vocabulary. Yeah. <laughs> um, and- I don't say it, I just pretend it didn't happen. Okay, it didn't happen, okay. So, but, but I think um, we just recognizing, it was, it was in this- movement where self-care was just kind of a catchphrase in education. And I was, in, I joined a self-care committee for my district and I sat down at the table and they had already started. So I kind of weaseled my way onto this committee because of my passion. And the conversation around the table was about um, encouraging all the staff at each school site to host a uh, potluck mm -hmm. lunch. And like, it blew my mind. Like, how are we equating self-care to potlucks, right? Like I'm going to tell a teacher, um, please prepare dinner for yourself and your family tonight. And could you please prepare lunch for everybody tomorrow and then bring it all in along with everything else right. you bring in in the morning, plug in the crock pot, rush down there to check on it whenever you get a second, rather than going to the bathroom. And we're going to say that self care. 
And I mean, even when we're talking about massages or things that genuinely are self care, mm-hmm. it's akin to putting a guise or a band aid on a geyser mm-hmm. because we have to figure out a way to change the environments in which educators are living each day. So that's what my goal was with leading the whole teacher to create just really a framework and back it up with research and practical, simple ideas that we can implement starting today. Okay. So this is actually quite, when you said the potluck, when I first started uh, teaching, I was on my own single guy first time away from like not living with somebody and eating pizza pops. I don't know if that's a Canadian thing. Yes. Right. And so <laughs> pizza pops are like little calzones that you can put in the microwave that are like probably not even real food. And so pizza rolls that, in the state. Yes. Yeah, something pizza. like that. Right. Mm-hmm. And so then we would have these potlucks. I'm like, I, I don't even cook for myself. Right. <laughs> like I'm not like it was so anxiety inducing to do this. So I was like the buns guy. I brought in <laughs> buns because I could just go buy buns. Do you know what I mean? That was oh, like, yeah. my, that was my thing, right? So uh, it's funny because there are a lot of things that happen in staff time that I find give me more anxiety than lessen it. And that's mm-hmm. where I really struggled. And there is a, and I'm going to mess this up. I remember seeing this years ago and I've talked about it quite a bit is that we spent all this time on initiatives to, you know, uh, for staff wellness and, you know, like, you know, it, it basically for mental health and wellness, but we don't actually do anything to change the system that like basically causes the issue in the first place. Mm-hmm. And it was like, Hey, we're going to like work the crap out of you. Uh, we're going to make a day, like just packed with information. you feel like your mind's going to explode, but we have yoga at the end of the day. So <laughs> Right. And candy yeah. on the tables, right? Right. Candy, which is, you know, probably when, when you're thinking I, and that's a, this is a, you know, this is like a personal journey I've been going on. A lot of times the self care isn't by eating junk food as right. much as it feels good in the moment. It doesn't really help. And that's like, that's a, that's a hard thing. You know, like I, I know that I've struggled with weight. We're, uh, this is very personal struggling with weight because you go into staff rooms, it's someone's birthday. It's like cake. It's this, all this. I know this is a totally different than your book, but. Right. No. I struggle with, right? Like I right. With that. But I think George too, like that is absent from this book. And because mm-hmm. this journey to writing the book started when, mm-hmm. it, when I wrote, I, I put a tweet out there that said, teachers, if your principal could do one thing to support you, in the upcoming school year, what would that be? And this was like way pre-pandemic years ago. And I got hundreds of responses. And I asked the question of my teachers as I was a principal. Um, I asked, you know, the question on Twitter, everywhere I went, I asked a question and I took all the answers and I tried to categorize them. And they Mm -hmm. fell into five different buckets. And absent from those answers, like I think out of the hundreds of responses I got, maybe two mentioned food. Right. They don't want food. They want time. They want to feel valued. They want to be listened to. They want principals to show love for the kids and for the work. Those are the things that like really rose to the top. Love it. I love it. All right. Okay. So that leads into the second question beautifully. So I am, uh, so first I, this is like a, just a, who is this book written for? This is like a, this is one B who is this written for? Like, can a teacher read this book? You know, yes. is this for anybody like who is this who is this written for? So, I mean, specifically, the audience would be anybody who's leading adults, leading teachers. Gotcha. So, right. however, I love the idea of teachers as self-advocates and I'm having sorry. teachers read this and do a little reflection of like what's present, what strengths are in my work environment and what are, where are some gaps and how might I grab the reins and fill in some of those gaps. So uh, and I'll, I'll back you up on this one. Uh, one of the things I used to say as a principal is I cannot solve problems I don't know exist. So mm. if you're if you are a teacher that's listening to this right now and you're like, oh, I wish my admin would read this. If you actually picked up the book and said, hey, I'm really struggling. And here's actually some things I read in this book that might help. Mm-hmm. That's a good way, because I think part of it, too, is that when sometimes people don't necessarily know there's a problem, but when they find out they don't have any solutions. And I feel, as you said, they can advocate for themselves. So I love this. So, you know, this actually leads into the second question. If I read this book, like, what do you actually hope it achieves, you know, in education? I hope it achieves a conversation in a new framework and that 
can be customized to whatever environment. So like, um, I think one of the bravest things a leader could do is on my website, I have a short description of each of the pillars. And then I have this self-reflection guide where teachers can rank their level of satisfaction in each of the pillars on a scale of one to five. And then let's start having some conversations about what's present in our school, kind of what's our, what's our current state associated with the pillar and what's our desired state. Mm -hmm. Then we can make an action plan to, to move from the the current state to the desired state. Like I would love to see a school abandon all their committees and just have a committee around each of the six pillars. And, and I'm not telling any of this because I want to sell books. Um, because there are so many free resources on my website, you can go and grab a hold of them and I will support um, you in any way I can. You can just email me and I'll share resources with you. But I think- You should still buy the book though. Okay, I advocate. mean, if you want. The authors don't, I know you're that, and I'm that way too, but I'm gonna advocate for you. It is a very good book. So oh, if you're you. listening to this and you find stuff valuable, you know, there is lots of free stuff, but pick up the book. I really, trust me, if I'm saying it's good, it's good. Thank you, thank you. You know, so. Sorry, I interrupted you because I didn't want you to say don't buy my book. Oh, well, I appreciate that. So, um, but, you know, if you're interested in buying the book, yeah. I think another brave thing a leader could do is, you know, if you have teacher leaders, like team leaders in your building, do a book study with them. Principal, assistant yes. principal, team leaders, do a book study of leading the whole teacher and then talk about, again, that current state, desired state, what action steps can we take in order to create an environment where teachers are able to thrive because we know that when teachers thrive, students are going to thrive. Love it. I love it. Okay. Last question. And this is, and now I feel bad because this is like a question and it's like, because you could get in this a book, but I, I, now I feel bad. What is like one strategy you share in the book that could be helpful to someone listening to this right now? Okay. You don't have to feel bad. I mean, again, I like I have all like, sorts You should read the book though. Like, <laughs> you share something from the book. You get it for free right now, but you should get the book. And I and I'm not. I don't get any money for this either. Like I just <laughs> think it's a really good book. So I just wanted to share that. Well, thank you. Yeah. I think sometimes when we look at team building or um, culture building in our meetings, we think of like camp kind of activities, and it's so interesting because I've put a lot of stuff out like on on TikTok or about icebreakers and like beginning of staff meetings and, and what should we do? And there's, I get a lot of feedback. So it's, it's all good conversation. I, th- I don't mind just throwing right. things out there that might challenge yep. our thinking. Absolutely. But in the book, um, I actually share an idea that I got from Brene Brown's um, Dare to Lead book, which is identifying our own two core values and doing that collaboratively. And I'll just share with you a story from when I did this with my staff. Um, So basically, I on Brene's website, she has a list of 100 core values. And the the practice is you select the ones that speak to you, then whittle it down to 10, whittle it down to five, whittle it down to two. And I I was listening, re-listening to her book one summer a couple of years ago. And I thought, I don't even know what my core values are. So I'm going to do this exercise myself. And when I did that, the exercise, I identified two core values of mine as integrity and making a difference. Mm -hmm. And I thought, gosh, I really think my staff should know that these are my two core values because they, these core values motivate a lot of my behavior. Mm -hmm. But then Brene talks about like, what if the staff knew each other's core values. And she tells a story about her CFO and how he kept questioning her about financial decisions she was making. And he thought, she thought he was like really judgy and didn't trust her when they did this exercise. And she found out that like financial stability is one of his two core values, which like brilliant that he's her CFO. And that's one of his two core values, but she just began to look at his questioning of her in a different light. Like this Mm -hmm. is driven by your core value, not by your judgment of me. And the same thing happened in my staff. So um, we had a staff member who notoriously, and she knew this, um, was it felt a little judgy about like bulletin boards and kind of like the physical displays that would be up in the, the school. Like if I had put a bulletin board up, she would be out there like with a staple remover and a stapler and straightening things up. And, and I was like, finally, I'm like, I'm not even doing bulletin boards because I know I can't do them good enough. To, to for this particular staff member. But we did this exercise in identifying our core values at the beginning of the year. And one of the core values on Brene's list is beauty. 
And I thought, who's going to choose beauty as one of their two core values? Like I was a little judgy about that. But this staff member chose beauty as Mm. one of her two core values. And the end game there is we started looking at that as a strength of hers and a gift she can provide the school rather than a judgment. So understanding it was more about her and her view of the world than about us. And like she became the head of the beautify Quincy elementary committee. Yeah. Yes. So that's team building. Mm -hmm. That's understanding each other. That's way better than any kind of camp activity. And of course there has to be a culture of trust and how we did this activity um, with my staff is I, I bought little canvases from the dollar store and, and I bought paint pens and they created just a little piece of artwork. They had their name and their two core values. And I didn't make them stand up in a circle and share their core values with each other because some of them seemed a little bit uncomfortable with it. Like it was a little personal mm-hmm. for them. Mm-hmm. And so um, they were, they just shared them in small groups with their, mm-hmm. their team. So I think we just have to be careful when we're, when we're doing activities like this about how we ask them to share with each other, but yeah. it, it was hugely valuable for um, my staff. And I think for any staff. Well, you know, the, that, that, I love that focusing on core values and, you know, really kind of that asset thinking Mm -hmm. and developing strengths there. There was a time I was in uh, a school and I remember being there and I, I really, one of the things I always challenge people is to look at things with fresh eyes. Like you've never been there before. And there is in the gymnasium where they'd have, you know, or sorry, the auditorium where they'd have big events and things like that. And the whole school go into, there's like a, a, a big portrait. I can't remember what was in the portrait, but what I can remember was the frame was cracked and it was broken. And I'm like, do you understand that every time kids walk into this room or there is this, basically this portrait that has a giant crack in it. It's just like, like we just let things kind of go around here. Right. And mm-hmm. there's, there's, I, you know, I, I've shared the story before. There's a certain sense in, um, it tells you a lot about a leader if, if they if they see a piece of garbage in front of the school and if they walk by it and ignore it or pick it up mm-hmm. because because it does say something to our community it does say something to our kids that we don't necessarily care enough about this space to you have it look its best so like that notion of beauty that's the first thing i thought of was how, what does that say to our kids when we don't really care about the surroundings that they're walking into every single day as opposed to like we have a sense of pride because right. this is such a beautiful place and this is so important on you know, how we respect, um, you know, the, the area. So I, I just love that. So I, Allison, first of all, I've known Allison, we met, I spoke at, what was it? Is it Memspa? Is that what yep, it is? Yep. So the Michigan elementary is Paul. I think it's Paul Liebenau. Is he yeah, still, he's there? still there? Paul, yeah. Paul, I saw him on Twitter the other day. A uh, very nice man. And yeah. that was where we first connected. And, um, I think he started blogging right after then and I've followed you ever since. And it's just been amazing to see all the great work you're doing. So I'm very proud of you. Kind of, I'm kind of being dad like right now. I mean, you are older than me, so we'll barely. Let's just say barely. (laughs) No, but this book is fantastic. Lead with collaboration. Both of them are going to be actually shared down in the links below. Allison, thank you so much. Now you can do whatever you want. We finally got this out of the way. You All don't, right, have, target, to, here you I don't come. have to answer my texts anymore. You can just go <laughs> back to ignoring me like you have been. But oh, right, right. But hey, check out check out leading the whole teacher. Check out leading collaboration. Another epic, epic book review. Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks everyone for being here. I hope you have a wonderful day.